What did the grape say as it was crushed? Nothing. It just whined. What's going on YouTube? Today we are bringing you the mid-game player guide. Now this guide is going to focus on a couple different things, but namely it's going to be for you who are in the mid game and you're trying to think about how you can start maximizing some of those systems to get yourself ready for end game pve end game pve uh and that's going to be trials that's going to be arenas dungeons that you should start farming it's going to be pvp content how you can start getting ready for it how to make sure that you have the traits necessary how you have the right skill lines necessary it's really about how you can start tweaking your gameplay, but also understanding different systems. So that a lot of this video will be focused on things that you should do um, and how you can kind of prepare yourself to do those things. Uh, also with conversations around, you know, how to make gold, how to participate in different ESO events, and so on and so forth. So everything from champion points to how to get into different types of content is going to be covered in this video. Let's jump into it. But we just passed 15,000 subscribers, so if you guys would not mind hitting the like and subscribe button, we are on the road to 16,000. This video was a suggestion by you, the viewers. The majority of all of my videos are honestly suggestions and comments that you guys have, and I try to make little video guides, whether it's a short, uh, whether it's a full dedicated video, whether it's included in another video, uh, just for you guys. I do read all the comments and I love you. So the number one thing that I wanted to start with, because I have mentioned this in some of my other videos, is you always want to actively participate in whatever ESO event is currently out. Right now it's the Zeals of Zenthar event, and I highly encourage you guys to whatever the event is actively participate in. The, the way to get started will always be in the featured crown store. Uh, you'll be able to go in, utilize the event quest, and you'll be able to hop on in. And for those of you who are like, man, Jake, you know, I don't really want to watch a dedicated video that's 10 minutes plus long on how to maximize an event. I want to be pretty self-sufficient. I totally get it. I love to teach a man how to fish, even if he doesn't watch my future videos. If you want to know how to prioritize your time in an event and know what it does, all you need to do is go down to the help section. From the start menu, go to tutorials. This is right below customer service, get me unstuck. And then you just scroll down to events and it will tell you about every single ESO event. It'll tell you about the different items, how they work. But if you also scroll to the bottom, it will tell you about how the events in ESO's chronological order. Zilla Zenthars at the bottom starts with a Z and it'll tell you everything from reduced way shrine cost to vendor uh, decrease cost to where the event quests are to what you know you get from the parcel boxes to how you get the parcel boxes it is a great resource that i always encourage you guys to read uh this is also the same information that's on the eso web page so you're more than welcome obviously to read it there uh, what's nice about the eso web page is obviously the information goes there because you might not know what event is being released until it's out unless you do go to the eso web page so keep that in mind i always do a dedicated video on every single ESO event, so you feel free to watch that. But the reason why it's good to participate in these things is for a very simple reason. Uh, this, for example, is a great way to maximize your XP for crafting. And a lot of endgame players might not need to level up things like crafting, but a lot of you will need crafters. Uh, some of the tips and tricks that I'm going to give you are going to be, you're going to want to make sure that you really have a lot of specific traits, uh, notably impen, especially for PvP, but also even things like reinforced, making sure you have that on chests and legs. Uh, well fitted is also a pretty popular one for PvP that gets overlooked. Also for PvE, you know, making sure that you have divines. But maybe also that you have, you know, different other pieces as well if you're looking into becoming a tank. Crafting is an essential component of ESO because what it does is it saves you from having to farm a dungeon over and over again it used to be back in the day that whatever trait you got on a piece of armor was what you were stuck with but in these days you can train you can transmute and you can then take one trait and get a new trait a trait that's garbage to a trait that's helpful so it's become exceptionally helpful to utilize those transmute tokens and we'll talk about transmute tokens later in the video and how to prioritize those but this just the only downside is, is that you have to actually have the trait. So say I get a piece of training gear, which I don't want training. Training's not going to make me do oogles amounts more damage. I want something like divines, which is going to boost my Mundus stone. 
Uh, if I don't have divines learned, say I have, say I got medium hands, and I want to take this medium hands in training, and I want to make it medium hands in divines, I have to then have medium hands divines learned. So it's important to start learning those traits now, because the more traits you already have learned, the longer it takes. They start off at only like an hour or two, and by the end they can take days. Now that's why it's important to start with the good ones, like the ones I was saying earlier. And if you really want to go into being like a tank, I would suggest a little bit more specific ones. But if you're going into a PvP or PvE DPS, Divine Zimpen, the two most number one ones, reinforced for uh, heavy pieces is also good. That's like your chest, your legs. Those are good options as well. Uh, but really, those are the ones that you want to focus on unless you are dead set on doing something very specific through a specific guide. The next point of conversation I want to talk to you guys about is champion points, because champion points is one of those systems that just wildly confuses people, but it can be boiled down to its simplest components. So the question is, notably, when you become level 50, if any of your other point, any of the other characters have champion points, you guys are all equaled out. So if I have a level 600 champion point character and then I level up, you know, little Timmy, uh, little Timmy to level 50, well, guess what? He's now champion point 600. Here's the other thing that might also confuse you. Little Timmy at level 1 can utilize those champion points. The only difference is he can't wear level 160 gear until he hits level 50. It's very convoluted, and I'm sorry. Think of it like this. You can use the champion point buffs on a below level 50 character, but you won't be that champion level until you hit level 50, which, you know, at one point or another was the max level and they had a whole different leveling scheme. But they give champion points like bonuses. Each one is focused on a specific thing. Green is kind of the crafting one, which I don't, I don't really know if it's I call it the crafting one. It's more of the like, here's a bunch of random things that you can do that are non-combat related. Uh, Warfare really seems like it's focused a lot on crit chance and magicka, uh, stamina, and single target damage, uh, AoE damage and whatnot. And then fitness seems it's like it's focused on a bunch of other kind of niche things, uh, ranging from like cooldowns to stamina restores to armor and so on and so forth. So it's kind of an interesting topic that people are always like, well, how do I champion point build? The number one thing that I like to do in craft that I like to suggest is actually the speed, being able to re boost your speed. And there's a couple ways that you can do that. But let's first talk about holistically here. How this works so these ones on the side and the ones on the side of all of the uh, ones can be attributed at any point now these ones that are kind of this white color not like this yellow one are actually ones that have to be put on your attribute bar to actually work so you can see that there's a little symbol there that means that it's one of my four currently selected and you can flip between them but that's why you see them highlighted a different color these other ones that I have right now, these are not activated. They're not on the champion bar. And the reason I mention this is because you can actually swap these relatively easily. Uh, if you don't have a lot of champion points to kind of pick up all the ones that you want, you can always respect for free at an armory station. Uh, but you can also, if you're like, well, I'm going to go pick up a whole bunch of furnishing plans. You could just take one of the ones off that you have. I could just be like, well, I'm not fishing right now. Boom, I'll go get these 10%. So... How do you build to this point? Well, you have to actually build in a line. And it's not, it's, it always confuses me why they did it like this. Because it's like, well, here's a line. Why can't I like start here? Why can't I skip this one? Why, why am I starting here? Don't, don't, don't question those things. But basically, you can see that you have to take a small portion of specific ones to go through a certain point. So you can see my starting point was here. Uh, I wanted to get this one because I fall a lot. And then I went this away, got this one. You want you have to get it up to one stage, and then you can kind of go in different directions. And you can see that I went both this away, and that I went also this away. It is unfortunately a bit of a convoluted system, and it's not something that I think that is very well explained, especially in the craft one. But what I would say, some of the easy ones that you want, mount speed is just very good to have. Uh, War mount can also be good too because it removes the stamina costs. Of riding a mount uh, so that can be very helpful especially if you have low mount uh, stamina speed double yields can be very helpful if you find yourself picking up a whole bunch of stuff in the overworld 10 percent furnishing plans also great decreased time for fishing these are the fishing ones kind of over here uh, movement speeds also love it reducing the cost of upgrading gear i think is relatively useless 
and reduce the cost of sneak can be helpful depending on the type of content you're doing. Uh, but these other ones over here, I'm not a huge fan of. Although I would say that reducing the radius you can be detected can be helpful for different types of content. So keep that in mind when you kill an enemy with Blade of Well. I don't know if I... I'm sure that you could find a, a utilization for this. Uh, like if you were doing the, I call it the 2-1 method, which is where you pickpocket somebody twice and then you use the Blade of Will once on them. Might not be a bad suggestion, although generally you get caught more so because you get caught pickpocketing them, not because you get caught Blade of Willing them. Uh, and 75 is a big commitment, but some to consider. And then increases the chance of higher uh, quality loot while pickpocketing. Not a bad one to get if you're doing that thing. Escaping from 25% of your current heat not super helpful so that's kind of the green tree now as we go into the other trees this is where you have to start thinking about the type of content you're doing because for example pve and pvp are very different and it it can be explained relatively easily so one of the more popular trials i'm just going to pull an example out the wazoo there are trials out there where you really probably won't take any damage the whole time so in those situations why do you need health why do you need any health at all? You're not going to get touched. Why well, have it? Do you need damage resistance? No. Do you need health recovery? No. Do you, need a, do you need a shield? No. But then for PvP, are people going to touch you inappropriately? Most definitely. And you're not going to like it. And it, it will probably not be consensual. So that's where there's a difference. Now, because of that, PvE players really build towards just straight damage DPS, numbers, there are exceptions. There's different types of dungeons and arena content that requires you to not be like a wet pool noodle if you were to be touched yourself. But most of the time when you're building for that true end game PVE, you really build into things like crit, damage, more damage. It's just getting all that damage out of there. And then for PVP, it's, you have to really have a mixture. You have to be like, well, I don't want to die. Is if I'm dead, I can't deal any damage. That's problematic. Nobody's going to kill the other, and I can't kill the other person if I'm dead. So I have to be alive, but I also have to deal damage to them. So I have to have this balancing act of dealing damage, but also being alive. So that's where there's a difference that comes into play. Now, there are exceptions, like there's Night Blades that really can build like a PvE character almost in certain aspects. Don't have to aspect as much into things like damage and whatnot. And that's an important consideration. But for the majority of people who are specking into PvP, I generally recommend at least 30,000 health. Uh, and I think that that's really just like the baseline. If you're going to, you're not going to see any DPS characters in a veteran trial with 30,000 health, barring a few exceptions. So those are the, really some of the key examples. And that's what you want to take into your blue and your red line. And that's why it's nice with the armory system, which again gives you two free slots and it get, for every character, regardless if you have ESO plus DLC or not, or not, you will be able to easily be able to spec into both PVE and PVP. And now for this little thought experiment, I promise it won't take too long because a lot of you guys probably know about champion points, but I like to keep it very simple. If I find myself doing a lot of single target damage, single target. This could be for both PVE or PVP, depending on the type of thing that you play. And I do a lot of direct damage. But sometimes for PvE, I'll spec myself into area of effects because I do a lot of AoEs of the Sorcerer. It just depends. Same down here where I have Max Mag, Weapon and Spell, and then I have don't have the Max Stam. Max Stam is usually a really good option for PvP Sorcerers to have as a Mag class because you got to be able to roll dodge. You got to be able to block. But I already have so much built in with my food and with my enchants, I don't find myself needing endless endurance because some of these, as you remember, these little white stars, you can only have four on at a time. So you can't get a whole bunch of them. Now, you want to make sure that you get these little yellow ones because they are free. And you also want to try to get some of these purple ones as you're able to. But you'll find out that really not a whole lot of them are helpful. In some aside of these you know, purple ones, you'll find some yellows, but you'll also find some whites. Whites still have to be added back to that bar which we don't want to have to do because we really want to focus on the big boys. That is our master at arms, which is our direct damage. That's our single target damage, weapon and spell, and max magicka. But this changes when I go to PvE. I don't need to have 
you know, the different same types of things. I actually might want to have different types of things, like crit damage to enemies I'm flanking, because guess what? A boss is going to turn around to face our tank. But when I'm fighting somebody in PvP, I can't, I can't keep respectfully asking them to turn their ass around. So those are the things that I want you guys to be considering as you're specking into your champion point. And you can think about the exact same comments with the final tree, except you also have to kind of think to yourself too, for example, Bastion, increase the effectiveness of your damage shields and damage against shielded enemies by 3%. You're not going to find a whole lot of shielded enemies in PvE content that's really more PvP focused, but there could be situations where you're farming something specific where an enemy might be shielded, but that's going to be very hinged upon what you're farming. So just kind of think about this stuff in the back of your head, but don't put too much thought in it because there's so many guides. I even have the guides linked below that say, here's what the exact champion points you should have are. This is more so for you guys who are going into things like arena, world boss content, and PvP, where there's less specific content to you versus endgame PvE, which is going to be very much like have these specific traits, have these specific gear sets, have these specific champion point loadouts. This is more so for you guys who are kind of creatively, you know, going through while you level up, like figuring out what you want to spec into first. And I will say too that Having not having a lot of champion points doesn't preclude you from doing anything. You're probably not going to be able to get on the scoreboard for a lot of this stuff, but I have seen level below level 50 people, level you know, four to five hundred champion point people complete things like veteran sunspire. A lot, if not all, of the veteran trial content can be completed by anyone of any level, and it actually comes down more so to your ability to rotate which is something we'll talk about a little bit later. And for this next portion, I am in Craglorn, which is like the social trial slash kind of dungeon hub of ESO. Why are we here? And let's talk about the next kind of portion of the video, which is going to be PvE focused. So there's a lot of you guys who are very much of different mindsets and different skill levels. Some of you watching this video have made done hundreds of trials, thousands. Some of you have done zero. And this is going to be for both of you. So, if you have been able to complete any veteran dungeon that is a DLC dungeon, and you've been able to do that, guess what? You are pretty much able to do, I would say, any base game trial. That's going to be most commonly your Ethereal Archive, which is VAA, uh, which is Veteran Ethereal Archive, or... NAA, which is Normal Ethereal Archive, or Hell Ross Citadel. So whenever you see people type VAA, that's Veteran. If you see N, that's Normal. So And then Hell Ross Citadel is the same kind of shtick. So if you've been able to do a Veteran Dungeon, I would say if you can do it, you are good enough to go into a team that's going to be able to do those trials. Because I would put the... And th this is why. So... When the base games in the entirety of ESO was created, there were only the base game sets that existed. Every set that's added, every champion point system that gets built upon, every new guild line that gives you new passives, every time they do that, they increase the power level. But they don't make the base game dungeons or base game trials any harder. They're exceptionally easy. And to put it in perspective, the final boss of VAA will have less health than I believe the first trial boss in a veteran trial. Uh, so just to put in mind the difference just between veteran trials, which means that you could easily do those types of content. And for another bit of perspective, if you farm something like Moon Hunter Keep, Moon Hunter Keep's final boss, I believe, has more health than the normal versions of Hell Ross Citadel and Ethereal Archive. So if you've done that with four people, you'll probably be able to just crank through those bad boys. So why do I suggest doing trials then? Is it for the gear? Is it for that type of stuff? Not really. Why do I suggest starting to farm things like trials? And we have a whole next portion of this video is going to be on dungeons and things that you can farm for gear and to just practice different types of mechanics. It's actually for the social aspect of it. There are a lot of you that just don't like to farm trials because you think it's very overwhelming and you think that it's very hard. 
And really this portion of the video is to, to really explain to you guys that if you're doing random daily dungeons on veteran, you've probably completed harder content than a veteran ethereal archive or veteran, veteran hell Ross citadel. You've probably done it. Now you've definitely done it harder than normal ethereal archive and normal hell Ross citadel. So I really want to push you guys into doing those two trials because it's a good way to learn how to coordinate with people. Uh, if you play on PC, it's a good way to get into different groups of people that coordinate those. If you're on PlayStation or Xbox, it's good to kind of see, you know, the, from party mechanics, how people organize, how people meet, how people kind of do these things. It's just a great social experience. And once you have completed a couple of trials, Ethereal Archive, Hellroth Citadel, what is the next step? The next step for you, my friends, is you're going to farm Cloud Rest on normal. Cloud Rest is one of the most interesting dungeons in the entirety of the Elder Scrolls Online. And the reason for that is because it is set up very uniquely and it's set up very thoughtfully. Why is that? Well, if you were to go into Cloud Rest, which is what I'm going to do, you'll notice it's broken down into different sections and there's different side bosses. And then there's a main boss in the middle. You can either choose to kill all the side bosses who each one will have their own little mechanics, or you can kill the final boss and then the side bosses will come throughout the fight. So it teaches you a lot of interesting and helpful mechanics as you kind of learn. So as you can see, there's different little side areas and there's one big area. And that's why there's different cloud rest tiers. People will say, I'm looking for NCR plus one, NCR plus two, NCR plus three. The NCR plus zero, a plus zero is you kill all the side bosses first. And each one will have a mechanic that you kind of do very lightly. And you still get trial gear for killing the little side bosses who have like potatoes worth of health. And if you try to do Cloud Rest on level three, which is where you do all of the side bosses and the main boss at once, you have a higher chance, I believe, to get rings and other types of gear uh, from the final boss. So there's reasons for doing the plus three or the plus zero. The reason why I suggest it though is now you're really starting to learn some of the mechanics. The mechanics that are taught in cloud rest are mechanics that you're going to more commonly see in other trials either that are already released or in upcoming releases. You know, things that require you as a DPS to do specific things um, that might be a little more team coordination heavy. Also, the gear that you get from Cloud Rest is absolutely phenomenal. Some of the best sets in the game are from here. Olo uh, is probably one of the number one sets for you to farm, and so is Reliquin. Now, there's a whole lot of different sets that we're going to talk about in the next portion of the video that you might want to start farming as well, but we're going to be focusing on the next part of the video about dungeons to farm. There are crafted sets and sets from the overworld. Yeah, those are great, but you don't really have to, like, dedicate a whole lot of time to getting an overland set in the same way and a lot of these dungeons that we're going to focus on will be able to give you something that's going to be helpful uh, for your pve experience and just a fun little factoid so a lot of you guys might not know what is a dlc dungeon versus a base game dungeon so all of the base game dungeons are in alphabetical order and then it starts all the dlc dungeons in alphabetical order so if you notice that it's after bal Sinar, well then you're now into the DLC uh, dungeon range. So the number one, one that I would suggest starting with is actually Black Drake Villa. I love Black Drake Villa because while the set Kinraz might not be the number one best in slot set, I would say it's probably in the top three, but the actual dungeon itself teaches you a lot of really cool mechanics, things like secret bosses. It teaches you things like hidden objectives, hidden puzzles, there's a secret final boss. It as a dungeon is very complex and unique and the rewards for doing so the, the number one reward being the kinra set which you're going to want to have for your end game guide uh, which is something that we are going to have as a separate video uh, but a part of the mid game video is making sure that you're starting to do activities that get you guys close to that kind of end game point and black drake villa is going to teach you those mechanics it's also going to give you the sets and things that you guys need to be ready for the ESO endgame. And this next one is Falkreath Hold. Now Falkreath Hold isn't like a glamorous dungeon, but it does have Pillar of Nern, which is probably the number one current best PvE set in the game right now. 
So while Falkreath Hold is really just more of your traditional dungeon, I would say that it still teaches a lot of really nice mechanics. I think every ESO veteran dungeon that's been a DLC one does teach those mechanics really nice, but this also brings up an interesting point. You're probably thinking to yourself, Jake, do I have to farm these on veteran? The answer is no. Here's something that I want to tell you, though, and we're going to talk about curated drops for a second. So a lot of one of the most mechanics in ESO that's not explained very well is curated drops. So buckle up. So here we just picked an unsuspecting dungeon. Now, if I was to farm City of Ash right now, what set would I get? What items would I get? What would I get from the first boss? These are questions that curated drops that we're going to explain. So everything except the final boss will give you a curated armor drop. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, Jake, you've got all three armors. And obviously this doesn't include monster sets because that only drops from the final boss on the veteran dungeon. That's for the helmets. And then the shoulders drop from your traditional uh, pledges. So this would only be Burning Spell, Weave, Ember Shield, and Sunder Flame. I would have a random chance to get any of them because I've already gotten my Curated Drop. Curated Drops happen once. Now, here's the downside. If I was to then kill the final boss, I would have a chance to get any jewelry and any weapons, which means that I could get any of these weapons except the ones that I already have. Why am I telling you this? Well, I'm telling you this because as you farm... And you might want to consider trying to get those jewelry pieces in purple first. Because if you get them on a blue, well then you're going to have to pay a pretty penny to upgrade them. So when you're thinking about curated drops and you're thinking about what can I get next, you're going to want to start considering, ooh, you know, do I want to farm this on veteran? Because on veteran you get purple gear. On normal you get blue. And that's really the only difference for not trial content trial content you can get perfected arena content you get perfected dungeons however it's very much quality it's either blue or purple and for most shit it doesn't make a difference because upgrading a weapon from blue to purple is almost free jewelry though very expensive so if the jewelry drop is important to you because your set might need it and your build might need it consider farming it on veteran if you don't have the jewelry because if I didn't have the jewelry, I could farm it and try to roll for that purple piece. Now, I can hear you thinking, what about chests? Chests are non-curated drops. However, however, if you get a piece of jewelry, you can, you can do this. You can farm veteran and get blue jewelry and vice versa. Then what? Well, unfortunately, once it's in your sticker book, it's there. Now, you could if, say, for example, you get a blue piece of jewelry and you don't want it. You can trade it to somebody else in that dungeon within two hours of the dungeon being completed. Uh, so keep that in mind. But this is very important as you're looking to get specific pieces of gear. Because Falkreath Hold and Black Drake Villa are the two number one dungeon sets for you to farm currently. In addition, I would continue to farm like Olo and Reli. Uh, from cloud rest those are also great options also and once you've started to get some decent pve sets you could start farming some other things my next suggestion once you've completed things like cloud rest once you've completed your uh black drake villa your falk wreath hold and you just got a little bit of pillar of nern a little bit of uh your kinraz you've got some other sets to kind of complement it even some cheap ones there are a lot of cheap flex options that you can use then you could start utilizing you know, other trials like Sunspire. So what are some cheap options that you could use? Say, for example, you're like, I've got, you know, Kinraz and Pillar of Nerds, which you probably honestly could combine together. Or what are some other ones? Mother Sorrow is just a cheap, easy set to kind of fill that gap uh, while you go into some trials to fill out that set. Uh, Law of Julianos is a really good option too. Very cheap, easy for you guys to be able to get. Even people suggest like Robes of the Withered Hand, which is a pretty easy, if not exceptionally easy set to get. And remember, these are sets that you're just coupling with what you have to give yourself a little more DPS to farm things like normal Sunspire, because then you're going to be able to get things like False Gods, which is a very good DPS set for PvE. Another really good option, too, that I think gets slept on a lot is I am a huge Basai supporter. I love Basai. 
I think that it's probably one of my favorite uh, PVE DPS sets, and that comes from Rock Grove. Why do I suggest Sunspire then over Rock Grove? Well, Sunspire is exceptionally easier, in my opinion, than Rock Grove. Somebody can tell me if they have a different opinion. That's totally okay. Sunspire is also very mechanic heavy versus very like DPS rays versus you have to do super, you know, crazy different mechanics that are impossible unless you have crazy DPS or overheals. Uh, overheals think to yourself things like, oh, if you don't heal enough, then you're going to die instantly regardless. So I suggest Sunspire because of that, because Sunspire is really just your ability for your tank to make sure that the dragon is facing this away and that you're facing over here and attacking from this away. Uh, it's very easy comparatively, and it just requires you to kind of follow directions from the tank. And I think it's a good kind of introduction to harder trials, but it's also itself not very difficult. It will require you to pay attention. It will require you to kill certain mobs before other ones, which is just great practice going into other ones, such as like Kynes Aegis, where that becomes even more important, and things like Rock Grove. Uh, but it does it in a more kind of user-friendly, new player-friendly way, and it gives you just a great set to kind of reward you for doing so. Another thing that you guys might want to consider farming is Maelstrom, for its Maelstrom Bow and Destro Fire Staff are two great options also. they have not essential as they used to be. They used to be in basically everything bar nothing. However, the addition to Mythicals has kind of rolled that back a little bit. So... How do you farm an arena versus farming like four-man content or a trial? Because dungeons, relatively straightforward. Trials, relatively straightforward. We kind of talked about that. And a lot of people can farm both of those things. So how do you go from farming that to farming something like a solo arena? And what I would suggest is, is that there's some really good mythicals and monster sets to help you. Namely, the Pale Order Ring, I think, is a godsend because it can really help you with Kind of an automatic sustain uh, but also if you don't have that i think sets that are similar like ice heart can also be very good ice heart basically gives you a damage shield uh, and it kind of protects you uh, versus pale order which heals you as you deal damage both of which are great options as you go through you will likely have to watch a maelstrom arena guy because it's a little bit mechanic heavy but also remember too that you don't have to have perfected versions of these gear you can farm it on normal to see the mechanics, see how things work, and it's probably about the equivalent of an easy veteran dungeon on doing it on normal. So I highly encourage you guys to go in there. It is a little bit different. It's kind of almost like building a little bit of a PvE character. Back in the day, instead of using things like Pale Order, people would use like Plague Doctor to get that health. You certainly, in my opinion, don't need that these days because remember, you have the champion point system. If instead of having a little bit of health, you know, from sets, I would instead get that from your champion points. If you want more magic of stamina, get that from your champion points. Even switch your Munda Stone around, maybe. I would not encourage you guys to utilize a different set because it'll be a lot faster if you use some of those specific sets that you've been farming from those dungeons or even just that you've been getting from the overworld. And there's going to be a lot of mythicals that are going to be able to help you. Next up, we're going to talk about mythicals, more so focused to DPS mythicals for both PvE and PvP content. If you're looking for more like tank-specific mythicals, I'd recommend watching the Tank Club on YouTube, but this is really going to be focused on your journey as a DPS character, whether it's PvE, PvP, uh, solo, arena, world, overworld, four-man, etc., etc. Death Dealer's Fate is a great PvP set. It's going to be able to give you a lot of mag, health, and stam. It builds while you're in combat and then goes away as you get out of combat. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see this very easily right now, so let me just get rid of my face for you. So, basically, you stay in combat. Why this is so nice is that while you're in combat for your PvP situations, you can get a lot of extra health, stam, mag. Uh, for us magic characters, this is paramount because... We need Stam, we need Health, and we need Magicka, and it gets us across that 30k threshold that I really recommend as a minimum. The next good one that I recommend is the Gaze of Sithis. Gives you a lot of max health, max recovery, armor, but you can't block. This is also a great in arena set, uh, especially if you have things like Crit Surge, or if you're just a Templar, and you get a lot of kind of self heals already. You might not need all of the healing that the Pale Order gives. You might want a little extra bulk. 
Our Pooter's Kill is just hands down the best one. Gives you a bunch of crit chance. Gives you crit damage. It's just absolutely phenomenal. Highly suggest it. Malakaz Band of Brutality has been used. Increases your damage by 16%, but decreases your critical damage done by 50%. This used to be a very significant mythical. However, it's been nerfed. It's been changed. I would say this, unfortunately, has kind of fallen out of favor from a lot, but it is still a whole lot of damage. Uh, Mark and Ring, very unique. I have this myself. I've used it quite a bit. Gain 100 weapon and spell and 1157 armor for every three piece sets you're wearing. This can be built out pretty well. I encourage you guys to use this if you're really trying to build anything fun with it. Certainly a fun one to use. Not one that you need, though. Mora's Whisper is an interesting one. It gives you a critical chance, inspiration, alliance rank, and alliance skill, and 12% monster kill experience. More an overland type content uh, mythical, but something to consider. Oaken Soul needs no introduction. Gives you a lot of buffs, but you can't bar swap. Some trials and content, though, you're going to have to bar swap. It's a requirement because that's just how the cookie crumbles. If you can't bar swap, you might have a one-shot mechanic on you, most notably in Cloud Rest. So you're probably not going to be able to use an Oaken Soul build, but Oaken Soul builds are out there. They are prevalent, and they are super easy to build with this ring. Next up, we have Pale Order, which again needs no introduction. Restores 20% of the damage you deal as health. This decreases when you're in groups, which is why you don't see this uh, as much. But it does also allow your companions to heal you, which I feel like is new. Ring of the Wild Hunt, one of the best overland farming sets in the game. Super good for you to be able to just go pick up ingredients, pick up things, quest, content. Absolutely good. Phenomenal. Sea Serpent's Coil is a really good PvP uh, one. While at full health, you gain 40% damage reduction, which is great. After taking damage while at full health, you gain Serpent's Rebuke, snaring yourself and gaining major Berserk and major Courage. This I've seen people talk about from a PvE standpoint. However, what you don't kind of, or we haven't touched upon this so far is, is that yes, certain buffs can be great, but you sometimes will get a lot of buffs from other players. You got to remember you're playing with a bunch of other hooligans who can also buff you. And it doesn't make sense to wear sets that give you the same buffs you can get from another person. Shapeshifter's Chain is probably, if not the best mythical for a werewolf. Snow Treader's boots are significantly underrated. Uh, I just don't currently use them. Never used them. Uh, and then it kind of goes down. We got the Thrashian Stranglers, which is one of the best PVE farming sets in the overworld. In my opinion, also, you can just start dealing oogles amounts of damage. And you're really not super worried about things killing you in the overworld. And then we have the new amulet, which gives you penetration and increases your damage done to monsters by 15%. Gain minor force at all times, but you reduce your light and heavy attack by 99%. This is brand new. I've heard it's absolutely phenomenal. So I can suggest that you guys go and farm this also. Another thing I just want to quickly touch upon is making sure you're farming your actual transmute crystals. You guys, as you are mid-game players, are really going to start wanting to make sure you stockpile those. You can only have a 1,000 at once, but you're going to need them later because you're going to be farming all these dungeons. You're going to be getting your curated drops, and you're going to probably want to change some of those traits around. So not only are you going to want to make sure you're researching, which I've already whacked you guys over the head with in the new and returning player guide, you're going to want to make sure you're farming transmutes. The three easiest ways to do it, in my opinion, are doing your random dungeon, your random battleground, and getting your campaign rewards. Campaign 1 rewards from Cyrodiil. What does that mean? It means that if you just go in, and I think you have to get around like 30,000 uh, AP in your home campaign, well, you're going to be able to get to end of campaign rewards tier 1, which is going to give you 50 transmutes per character. Per character, which means that you can get hundreds in a single campaign. This one ends in 24 days. I am about halfway through to rewards tier one. I think I just went on to go buy stuff at a, um, a vendor and then I got distracted for like 10 minutes. But you can easily get to rewards tier one in under an hour per character. So take 10 characters through and that's 500 transmutes, which the average cost that you're going to need for your transmutes is between 25 and 50. So keep all that in mind and go out there and get those transmute crystals. This next one is super simple. You guys probably already know about them as a more mid-game player, but just make sure you're doing your pledges every single day. This little hooligan generally gives the easiest ones, as does this little girl over here. 
And then this one gives out your DLC dungeons. They can be a little bit more tricky, but you just want to make sure you stack up on those keys because you are going to need to be able to buy some things from them every so often. You're going to want to eventually need to get some of these monster set shoulders at some point. The good thing is, is a lot of sets now use mythicals as opposed to these. So you don't have to do it every so often as, as much as you used to. But you're still going to want to make sure that you stock up on keys. I always recommend you get the rewards coffer that costs one because basically you get you can buy five uh, and then you're rolling for an, the odd to get them. And as a reminder, you're rolling for the odds of getting a light, medium, or heavy of both sets, not just one set or the other. It is technically still 50-50 because it's three-sixths. Uh, but I still recommend getting the five keys of one because then you still have a chance to get, you know, by the time you've used five keys to also potentially get a lot of different sets that you can stockpile and add to your sticker book. And these are non-curated drops. You also have a chance if you get the one key box uh, to get a higher chance to get things like mercenary modus, which sell for oogles amounts of money. Also, you can sometimes get some shoulder pages in here too from some monster sets that are featured. This next portion of the video, I just wanted to kind of quickly go over PvP. I feel like getting into the end game of PvP as a mid game player is not as hard as PvE because you can basically focus on just getting some specific sets. And you can also go to campaigns where champion points are disabled. So it doesn't matter how you use them. What I suggest is at least 30k health. Now, I actually don't have 30k health because I am using the Death Dealer's uh, Feet Ring, which means that as I'm in combat, I will build to about 33,000 uh, health and I build to about 52,000 Magicka and about 22,000 Stamina, which is more than enough. I am also a Vampire uh, as well. Now, there's a couple ways that you want to build a PvP character. I personally, as a sorcerer, subscribe to the method of having a lot of Magicka. And there are a lot of other people that subscribe to the building a lot of spell damage and weapon damage. And there's benefits to either or. Now, what's the main benefit to doing it the way that I'm currently doing it? The benefit is really quite simple, is that your shields stack off of your total health and Magicka. So I can create a shield for 21,000 damage which is a lot, and that's not even with my Death Dealer's Feet ring activated. So as a sorcerer who uses shields, this can be a big help to me. Now, as a reminder too, for those of you who don't know, the more Magicka you have, that also affects your spell damage, and the total stamina you have affects your weapon damage. And pretty much these days, with the equalization of things, it goes off whichever you have higher weapon or spell damage. So having more Magicka does make you also deal more damage. It's not as good as spe having like higher spell damage, but it will make you still hit exceptionally hard. Now, there's a conversation between proc and no proc. Some of you guys are like, Jake, what's a proc? And here we can play a little thought experiment or I ask you guys a question and I tell you if you're right or wrong. Is Necropotence a proc set? While you have a pet active, your Magicka is increased by 30... There are 3,095. Is this a proc set? Play the Jeopardy music. Can't because it'll be copyrighted. The answer is it's proc set. What is a proc set? A proc set is a set that relies on something happening to give you something. Now, the perfect uh, counter to Necropotence is Crafty Alfique. Crafty Alfique doesn't require anything to be happening, but it gives you less Magicka. So, by utilizing... What I have is Necropotence, I get more Magicka with the downside that that's a pet active. So proc sets generally give you more weapon spell, stats, etc. But they require you to proc something. Why are proc sets so much more helpful in PvP than any other type of content? Because two reasons. One, higher benefit. The second reason is, is that a lot of people will require burst to kill players. You can get burst from two places. Your skills or your sets and sometimes they can come from both but the reason why some people like to get them from their sets though is is that you know you might be getting hit by somebody who's doing a rotation on you and you might be like man this person hits for about this type of damage and then bam they hit you for three times harder and you're like what the heck happened and it's because they procced a lot of things on you uh, my number one favorite example is Rallying Cry. I think it's just a really good proc set that can be utilized for solo type PvP content. 
And in addition, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. I could show you another example too, where I have some different proc sets in my inventory. And I have a lot of non-proc sets in my inventory. Uh, for example, the Perfected Inferno staff is a proc set. Uh, what's really nice about this is basically after I flame clench, I got 600 weapon and spell damage for four seconds, which means that if I start with a flame clench, which is the morph of destructive touch, it's 600 free weapon and spell damage right there. And that is an extreme amount of damage to just use on people in a specific moment. And it can be stacked with other sets to kind of go along with it. But you can also opt for things that are a bit more plain Jane, like Ancient Grace, which just gives you Magicka. So those are the types of things that I think to myself. And when I'm looking at things like a back bar, you know, sometimes I think to myself, you know, do I want to use something where I'm going to have, you know, a little bit more penetration? I've used sets that get penetration. Uh, but sometimes, too, you could just have a single set that's just a back bar set, which, you know, like potentates, which reduces your damage taken by players by 3%. And you only need the two piece. Sometimes you might try to build in a whole, a whole five piece set in your back bar. And sometimes you might not even need to do that. It solely comes down to you. PvP is about your utilization as a player. How do you do it? How do you like to do it? Do you like to just deal good amounts of damage and have a lot of resources? Do you like to require a lot of different things to happen? Such as you using different abilities. Such as you light attacking such as you doing X, Y, or Z. And I have a whole video breaking this down more where I talk about set combos in PvP if you want to check that out. And my number one suggestion for practicing your PvP content is Battlegrounds. It has disabled champion points, so you don't even have to worry about being a low champion point level. Although, as a reminder, being a low champion point level does not make as much a difference as people may give it credit for. So you guys can just jump on in there and participate in that content immediately and there's an elo system which is basically just a matchmaking system that kind of tries to make it fair uh, based on your experience with that character so if you're brand new to a character you're not going to go against people who are like you know have used and won like a bajillion battlegrounds my number one suggestion for making eso gold is exceptionally simple as you farm your overlands as you farm content as you pick up things sell those things join five guilds that have guild traders and start listing up different items and keep those listings full and you will get passive income just throughout the week. It is exceptionally simple and I cannot understate how much easy gold it is uh, for you to get doing this method. I have whole videos where I suggest different types of things that you guys can sell uh, throughout the week and I just highly encourage you guys to watch those videos, my market watch daily, you know, monthly videos, watch those and you'll get a really good idea of what's selling, what's going to be coming up in the events that's going to be selling well, uh, and how you guys can profit off that specific month. Another thing that we've touched upon in this video, but not fully covered is vampires and werewolves. Vampires are just overall good to have, especially for PVP content, reduces the damage taken by up to 30% based on your missing health is great. You become harder to execute and finish off in a not gay way. Overall, very helpful. Some of these other perks are very much more niche, and a lot of times you don't see them as much in PvE content because the negative effects that you see from being a vampire become to really start to affect you, especially as you kind of go down into different types of PvE content, and you really don't want to start getting that regular ability cost to affect you too, too much because then it's really going to have a negative effect on your DPS rotations. And then werewolves, I mean, there's PvP werewolves, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're great in OP and whatnot, but do you really want to be a werewolf? Probably, if you're thinking to yourself, you do. Yes, they're OP for PvP content. They're very one-dimensional. They usually get focused a lot because people don't like werewolves. In PvE content, I've seen people do arenas with them. I've seen people do unique content with them. It is exceedingly rare. And the final point that I wanted to talk about and kind of explain to you guys, and this is just more of an explanation plus shameless plug to somebody who explains it very well, is parsing. And parsing is basically, in my opinion, just the act of doing a specific rotation of skills and or abilities in a specific order. Why is that helpful? Well, that's the majority of your gameplay. Whether you're fighting a 
PvE mob boss or you're fighting a PvP player, having a good rotation is the quintessential key to getting better at ESO. Now, for PvE, it's very easy to practice. You just hit a target dummy. And Skinny Cheeks has a great video on this, which I suggest that you guys watch. PvP becomes a little bit more tricky. You're probably going to have to start fighting some other players in Battlegrounds to really experience what it's like to see what it's like to fight other players because you're not going to be able to complete your rotations in the same way. You might have to switch and go, you know, oh, now I need to actually start healing myself. Now I need to start shielding myself. I need to reset some of my buffs and things versus a lot of times for PvE content, it can be very similar and very organic. Your ability to parse and do a rotation outweighs your ability to have any level of champion points, in my opinion. I have seen people use garbage PvE sets, and when I say garbage, I mean those that you can pretty much just buy on the market for pennies on the dollar, and parse higher than people with endgame PvE sets, because it is truly just an easy, essential way to get better at the game. And it's a way that you can practice and you can get better at in a non kind of stressful way. In my opinion, don't stress about your champion points. Don't even fully stress about the sets you're wearing because guess what? The best in slot PVE sets are going to change on a whim. They're going to change on a dime. Zoss will change how crit chance is calculated or crit damage is done or how flanking damage is all whatever. And it'll all change. Whether or not you have a good parse though, in the interim is going to be the difference between you being really good at PvE content and really in that kind of intro phase and learning how to do it. Same with PvP. PvP sets will come and go. They'll nerf things like health recovery or how much damage and they'll nerf shields. They'll change however much, whatever. They'll start changing stuff. But if you can really start to get a good combination down on you killing you know, another player and killing players and having that situational awareness, you'll be in a good spot. And that's really what I wanted to focus on in this video is we talked about a lot of systems. We talked about how you can practice in a lot of places and really, and I thought about making my own parsing video, but I am not the biggest fan of parsing in the sense that for PVP, it's really, you have to just fight other players. And for PVE, yes, you can parse, but also it really comes down to you parsing well it, you know, a lot of times people will be forced to submit parsing clips. I myself have submitted parsing clips. And it comes down to just your best run. And I used to run track in field. And I used to run the 100 meter dash. And I had some crazy best times. Would I Was I able to consistently hit those? Hell no. <laughs> so I've always been very jaded against people's ability to parse once really well versus just kind of having different clears and stuff. But that's kind of a, a higher tier conversation that's a much bigger tangent than what I need to get into. Uh, and I hope that I you know, helped explain this very well. But that's really the essential part of being a mid-game player that will elevate you to an end-game player. It's not the sets. It's not the champion points. It's your ability to parse and follow mechanics for PvE and for PvP, it's your ability to read situations and your ability to react to what other people are doing. And if you feel like those concepts need to be broken down, I certainly can. This video has gotten very lengthy, uh, and obviously the endgame video will have its own dedicated video with specifics and builds and specifics and things, which unfortunately will be outdated. So that's always my kind of reminder that always look for the most recent information. Uh, available, which is why I've kept this a little bit more informal in that aspect, but I hope that overall the guide was helpful for you guys. And there was a lot covered in the new and returning player guide, such as guilds and such as passives and things too. So if you feel like there's more information, check out those videos because they do a great job deep diving those topics. But your friends, that is going to wrap up the video. My cat has seen that the recording is about to end and she's come back to say goodbye to you guys. As a quick reminder, we are doing three giveaway drawings uh, for the month of August. That is going to be one random subscriber, one random person who has liked the video. So all you have to do is just like some videos uh, throughout the month of August. You don't have to leave comments anymore. I'm trying to make it easier for you guys. And then the third one will be a random audio and visual cue. It will be flashed upon a random video. 
And if you were the first person to comment that word in the comments below, well, then you, dear viewer, will win um, a giveaway drawing. And it's fun because I've done this. Last month I did it and somebody caught it. This month people have mentioned that they wanted an audio cue. Next month what I'm thinking is I'm going to do an audio cue and then I'm just going to flash like a gift card code uh, because previously when people have wanted stuff through the giveaways, it's either been like PayPal or ESO merchandise. Today was really the first time I've ever had to buy like e-gift cards and they're very simple. So I might just start like flashing like, you know, one video a month, just flashing like a $20 Amazon gift card. And then it encourages people to watch videos that are a little bit more niche. And two, like you can actually like, even if you don't win, you can go and you can look to see when the code was redeemed. So you can see that like, you know, a real person redeemed it and I'm not like crazy. <laughs> so, but a lot of you guys that watch these videos have won before because I've been doing these almost for two years now. And two years ago, I had like six subscribers. So, <laughs> so people have won twice because of that. So I want to thank you guys so much again for watching. I love all of you. I hope this video was helpful, if not overtly long. Thank you guys, and I'll catch you later. Bye, guys. You better remember to like and subscribe to Jake Clips. Or you should. I might have to pluck your eyes if you don't. Or better yet, I'll skip rope with your entrails. Do it now. Subscribe. Ta-ta. Off with you. So this little freaking goobs here was sick, and that's where I had been struggling to make some videos and that's why I made my post also about content for shorts just because my cat was sick and I called the vet and taken her to the vet on Friday and if certain symptoms change then I'll take her a little earlier according to the vet so that's what that's what's been going on in addition to tornadoes and there's apparently a tornado in Pennsylvania which is ridiculous in my opinion so it's been a little wacky um but I want to thank you guys again for sticking around in the post outro. This was a long in. Thank you guys, and I love you. Goodbye.